Is this it? Do you think this could be the tomb? Jesus of Nazareth is the most famous man of all time, but so much of his actual life remains a mystery. The Rolling Stone? Jesus. But that's about to change. Oh my God. I'm Jeff Rose. I'm an archaeologist and I'm an anthropologist. I've always been fascinated by the stories of the Bible and the archaeology of those stories and where they come from. Behind every legend, there's a compelling true story. My mission is to discover the evidence that brings this truth to life. You can call me the legend hunter. And I'm here in Jerusalem at the confluence of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. How can the latest discoveries in archaeology show us what the life of Jesus was really like? Jesus is one of the most important historical figures ever. Over half the world's population venerates this man. Now, whether you're Christian and you think he's the son of God, or you're Muslim and you think he's a prophet, he has had an absolutely essential role in, in our human history. Almost everything we know about Jesus comes just from the Bible. It's not surprising that, that the question of historical Jesus is, has been raging for 2,000 years, because in, as an archaeologist, you don't see an individual in the archaeological record. You see large-scale civilizations. So it's looking for Jesus is like looking for a needle in a haystack. But recently, archaeologists have unearthed new evidence throughout Israel, in Nazareth, in the Galilee, and here in Jerusalem. This trail of new evidence touches the most important events of his life. I'm going to look at the archaeological evidence, which helps build the picture of the life of Jesus and the world he lived in. Mary, the mother of Jesus, lived in Nazareth with her husband Joseph. The New Testament mentions that Jesus himself grew up in Nazareth. So my starting point, obviously, is Nazareth. This is Jesus' childhood home. Today, Nazareth is Israel's largest Arab city. During the first century AD, when Jesus was a boy, Nazareth was a small Jewish village. I'm just walking into the souk here in Nazareth. And the souk is a marketplace, and those are always the, the most fun parts of the Middle East, because you never know what you're going to find in the marketplace. Here we go. Let's give it a shot. Nothing. Until recently, there was no physical evidence that a Jewish settlement even existed here during Jesus' lifetime. Then, just a few years ago, an amazing find. Archaeologist Yardana Alexander uncovered the remains of a house from the time of Jesus. How did you guys find this site? How did you know to start digging here? Well, it was absolutely by chance. We saw that um, archaeological remains being damaged, so we started the excavation. This is the original wall of the first century house. What were these used for? Well, this was actually a room. And on this specific floor, we found pottery dating to the first century BCE, first century CE. She also recovered fragments from chalkstone vessels, domestic tableware used only by Jewish families. Now, who lived here? Is, is it a rich family, a poor family, can we say? It's a simple house. It probably had several small rooms and an inner courtyard. Uh, nothing elaborate about it at all. I would say just a simple family. Imagine if this Jewish family was Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. In a tiny village like this, it could very well have been their home, or one just like it. You know, outside of, of the Gospels, um, there really isn't a whole lot of evidence for there being anybody here in the first century, so that's one of the reasons this is so spectacular. Yardena says the house has another more shocking surprise. And just take a look in here. 
So I can just climb down into here? I'll follow you. Okay. Good I didn't have a big breakfast. We're descending into a 2,000-year-old stone pit that looks like a storage area. Some archaeologists have said these bell-shaped pits were actually silos for storage. Now, this is possible, but again, uh, as you see, we climbed down here with quite a bit of difficulty. Now, that was the last thing that the, the woman of the house was prepared to do, <laughs> yeah. come down here just to get a, a, pack of, a packet of flour. So they were purposely now, built to hide something. What do you think they had to hide? These pits were prepared for the time of war. When Jesus was a boy, this was a remote Jewish outpost in the vast Roman Empire, a place that knew destruction and conflict. So where was the safest place for women and children and boys like young Jesus? Underground. It's better to be uh, hiding in these pits than to be in danger from the Roman army. So I think this is what they were doing here. It does drive with the New Testament. It, you know, we have this picture of this oppressive Roman regime um, weighing down on the Jewish community, and we're sitting here in a bunker yeah. that they were using to hide it. We know from the Bible that the Romans put Jesus to death, and now we can see even in his childhood, he had reason to fear them. God, I can't imagine you know, huddling down here in fear with stuffy air and uh, kind of hot and really unpleasant. Imagine Roman centurions walking around upstairs. You'd be terrified. I have to ask this. What actual physical evidence do we have up here for the historic Jesus? We have learned a lot about first century Galilee. The villages of which Nazareth was one were small and they were only Jewish. We know that also from the written sources. I think it's safe. The Romans are gone. Let's okay, get out of here. Okay, let's get out of here. Air. <laughs> You know, that's fine for a few, a few minutes, but I would hate to be down there for a few hours or a few days. Jesus' formative years are still a mystery. I'm hoping my next stop fills in some details about his young life and trade. It's not going to be such a straightforward hunt. I'm going to have to look for clues all over the place, like a puzzle, try to put it all together and, and see what picture emerges. Maud Shufani is an expert in what day-to-day -day life in Jesus' time was like. I'm here at Nazareth Village, which is a completely reconstructed ancient village from the first century AD. We try and bring to life as much as possible of the first century life, because the more you know about that, the more you understand of the parables that Jesus used. So uh, here we have sheep, we have one goat left. Uh, some people though ask me, how can you tell which one is a sheep, which one is a goat? I say, look at the tail. See, tail is up, it's a goat. Tail down, it's a sheep. And that's a line from the New Testament. He will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. It's a character difference. See, goats are very independent and they are leaders by nature. Sheep are exactly the opposite. You see, they're sticking together like this and they're followers by nature. They're very right. dependent. Now, if they're this is actually perfect yeah, I mean, to <laughs> illustrate your point. They're all clustered here, and then this guy's off doing his own thing. Yeah. <laughs> this fits what you were saying earlier, but Jesus is he's preaching using metaphors that he knows. Sheep, goats, being a shepherd, you know, all these things. This is his world. This is what he was used to. Olive oil played a key role in Jesus' life. The Bible says, then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. You usually have a donkey working this. But you know, it's very essential if you want to press olives. You have to go around a lot of times? 
walk yeah, a few, quite a few times. Yes. So that's where the donkey comes in helpful. Yeah. So I've just done the job of an ass. <laughs> Jesus is known as a carpenter, but he would have had other skills as well. In the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, he's referred to as tectone, which means builder. So he would have been proficient in both wood and stone. Can you tell me what you're doing? What I'm doing now is making this piece of uh, stone for the window. Can I uh, give you a hand? Yeah, sure, I will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> you promise me you won't get mad if I ruin this. Sir. Uh, Remember, I'll, I'll be holding the weapons no, if no, I break it, so. The Bible says Jesus learned this trade from his father, Joseph. But I want to know where he worked. Ancient Nazareth is four miles away from Sepphoris, a wealthy city. So it's spitting distance. You could probably commute that in one, one and a half hours. Sepphoris is relevant because it's the major capital of Galilee. It's a Roman city right next door to this tiny little Jewish village. And in Jesus' time, it's undergoing a massive Roman-style renovation. So Jesus is probably going there every day and working as a tectone, as a builder, to rebuild the city. How might this wealthy cosmopolitan city next door have influenced Jesus? Archaeologist Modi Aviam has been excavating here for nearly 40 years. We are walking here on the one of the main streets mm -hmm. of ancient Tsipuri, Sepphoris. The classic grid design is a telltale sign of Roman influence. And as I understand it, we're on a major trading route from the Mediterranean to Damascus. Yes. So presumably there's lots of goods coming up through here, lots of, and with those trade goods, ideas. Yes. So Tsipori, Sepphoris is in the center of Lower Galilee. And only logical then that Jesus is working here. So here's the million dollar question that I've got is, Nazareth, just over there. Um, Jesus is a tectone, he's a builder. Would he have been employed here to, to work on these building projects? No reason to say no. No reason. So I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, I guess all of this is, is to figure out, would this experience here have opened his eyes to a larger world? Of course, ideas, perspectives, worldviews, the way people look, yeah. the way people dress. This is one of the uh, largest residential area that was excavated. So we are now within a house. So this is a big house, top of the hill. He's got his own water source. Each one. This is somebody wealthy. Uh, we can assume so. I wonder if Jesus himself might have worked on building this house. Over here is a cistern. It's still covered with its... I'm starting to get a picture of a rich Roman-style city where a poor Jewish kid from Nazareth would have been exposed to wealth and greed. Could that have inspired his compassion for the poor? Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. So Jesus is probably working here for years, building, cutting stones for these rich men. And, and seeing the social inequality firsthand and getting fired up about it. And I'm guessing at some point, he must have been so upset and so impassioned by this cause that he heads on down to the Sea of Galilee and begins his ministry there. Recently at the Sea of Galilee, one of the most amazing biblical discoveries was found, directly linking to the life of Jesus. So this is it. 2,000 years old boat. I'm in Israel piecing together the real life of Jesus. I now believe that Jesus likely spent his formative years as an apprentice and builder with his family in and around Nazareth. We pick up Jesus' life story as he arrives in the Galilee to teach. I'm looking for any physical clues to place him here. It's here, the scriptures say, he walked on water, healed the sick, and found his earliest followers. Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. 
among them two brothers who fished these waters. I'm here on the shores of the beautiful Sea of Galilee to meet the Lufon brothers. They made a one in a million discovery while out fishing one day from the time of Jesus. Nice to meet you guys. Permission to come aboard? Okay, come on. <laughs> The story starts in 1986. The Galilee is in the midst of a long drought that causes the water level to drop dramatically. And one day we are see nail, Roman nail, very old. And Timothy, another one, and another one. And these were square, not round, so yes. it was something interesting. Yes, we are said, wow, maybe it's boat. We are jumping in the air, we are dancing, we are crazy. The brothers discover an ancient wooden boat, very similar to the one the Bible says Jesus and his disciples used. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. When they lift it from the mud preserving it for 2,000 years, the boat is exposed to air and crumbles. Scientists race to cover it in foam to save it. Its potential connection to Jesus and his disciples is astounding. And after a 17-year restoration project, the so-called Jesus boat is unveiled to the public who come from all corners of the earth to see it. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, 2,000 years old boat. Orna Cohen is the boat's conservator. And the wood is like yesterday. Orna gives me special access to take a closer look be careful with these glasses. The boat is 27 feet long and seven and a half feet wide, large enough to fit a dozen disciples. The, the preservation is just mind-blowing yeah. here. This is all still intact. This boat survived 2,000 years, but it's nothing fancy. It looks like it's made from a patchwork of spare parts. We believe that this part of the keel uh, is uh, uh, reused from earlier boat. So I wonder whether the boat's ancient owners were common folk, like Jesus' followers. They were farmers and fishermen, uh, simple people. So they used whatever source they could. Everybody loves to call this the Jesus boat. What is the actual association between Jesus and this boat? As we say, it's from the time of Jesus. That's definitely. And anyway, no, everyone knows Jesus didn't owe anything. This boat is just the kind of physical evidence that I've been looking for. Given the location where the boat was found and its age, it's as if it came right from one of the best known stories in the New Testament. The Bible says it was here, Jesus saw two men casting their nets, much like I'm doing now. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I can see firsthand the influence of the sea in Jesus' metaphors. Well, I've got the boat. I'm on the Sea of Galilee. The crew's here, so I might as well try my hand at fishing. But this wasn't the only place he gathered his flocks. The Bible tells us Jesus preached in synagogues all along the shores of the Galilee. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. What I really need now is to get a sense of where would he have preached. So I'm gonna go to see one of the oldest synagogues in the world at a site called Gamla. And I'm gonna meet a guy called Danny Sion who excavated the site and hopefully he's got some clues for me. The synagogue is located on the northern shores of the Galilee in the Golan Heights. The Bible describes what Jesus preached, but I want to see where he preached. It's pushing 100 degrees here, but Danny Sion still takes me on a one-hour hike down a stony slope. Gosh, like a mountain goat. <sighs> So this is one of the oldest synagogues in Israel. Exactly. 
So I gotta ask you, you know, here we are, we're in the Galilee, we're in a synagogue. This is the kind of place Jesus would have come to, to address his congregation, address his people. We know of uh, just a f only a few places where he uh, went and preached, according to the New Testament. There is a chance that he might have come here. Next, Danny shows me a strange hole in the wall. What's this all about? This is actually a plastered water channel. See the plaster here? It's coming into the synagogue from a water cistern that's outside the town. And the channel went on along the wall, through that wall and into the mikveh. The mikveh Danny mentions is a ritual purification bath popular during the time of Jesus. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you. There seems to be a definite connection between the Jewish mikveh and early baptisms, which soon become central to the Christian faith. So within a hundred years of John the Baptist going around baptizing people, you see at the same time this, this ritual bath uh, phenomenon appearing all over. St. John did exactly what one does in the mikveh, but in the Jordan River. The New Testament says, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Pilgrims believe this is the very site that John the Baptist performed this ritual 2,000 years ago. Do you believe in Jesus with all your heart? Here, the faithful walk in the footsteps of the holy. It's moving to see the raw emotions they experience. In the time of Jesus, the Jordan River would have been a logical stop on the road to Jerusalem. And like any journey, food is part of the experience. It makes one wonder, what did Jesus eat? I had no idea biblical bars were so well stocked. <laughs> Jesus made the trek from Galilee to Jerusalem several times, and while it takes me about two hours to drive there, it probably would have taken him four days to walk. I've seen his home in Nazareth, I've seen Jesus' work in Sepphoris, his, his ministry in Galilee, and I've come here to Jerusalem where he was crucified and laid to rest. Imagine how weary Jesus would have been, and how hungry. I'm making a quick stop for a meal inspired by the Bible. Here outside the walls of the old city, they've got this biblical foods restaurant that specializes in foods of the Old Testament. So I'm gonna go check it out. I meet with restaurant manager, Charbel Ishak. Tonight you're gonna eat the, like, the food that the kings and prophets used to eat before thousands of years. So let's, let's see. go inside. <laughs> You're welcome to my kitchen. Thank you. As he puts me to work in his modern kitchen, Charbel walks me through what the Old Testament called the seven species, likely staples in Jesus' diet. A land of wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. We'll use a few of the ingredients in a dish called risotto frique, which is a cereal grain mentioned in the Bible. You know why it's called frique? No idea. No idea, because before 2,000 years, there was no machines to separate between the shell and the seed. So people usually use their hands. Yeah. And the sound that from it is... Freaky, it's freaky, 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 freaky. onomatopoeia. Yeah. Cool. So. I like how you went right for the wine. Yeah. <laughs> so the grapes for this are, are locally grown? Yeah. In that case, oh. Lechaim. Lechaim. <laughs> You're going to put me to work, huh? Yeah. At least the knives are sharp. Now we're cooking. So we got olive oil. So we got olive oil Very from... authentic. Chef Panache. While the onions caramelize, we prepare the mushroom caps. All right, a little bit of oil. Okay. 
we go. Cooking with Jeff. Then we add the next set of ingredients. Carrots, zucchini, mushrooms, and this one is the pumpkin. Moment of truth. Here we go. Oh, that's really good. Okay. So here it is, a nearly complete biblical meal. It's a meal fit for a king. My biblical cocktail is chilled and my fork ready to go. How do I say cheers in, in Aramaic? Hobo. Hobo. This is Jerusalem's old city, the heart of religious life in the Holy Land. There's the Dome of the Rock, there's the Al-Aqsa Mosque, there's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The faithful believe the Holy Sepulchre is the site where Jesus was crucified and buried. It's the last stop of the pilgrimage known as the Via Dolorosa, or Way of Suffering. We walk the paths of loneliness and the paths of suffering, the paths of anxiety. There's nothing that he went through that he doesn't share with us. So for you, it's not a literal path, it's a mystical path or it's a symbolic path. I've, you gotta let go of the literal path. It's the spiritual path. I believe that he once walked for all of us. The walk is short, but a profound religious experience for millions of Christian pilgrims from all over the world. It was amazing. Words really couldn't describe it, actually. Especially going from station to station in the prayers, and all the languages, too, and the crowd. You can feel the energy. These ancient stones have been here since the time of Jesus. We know from the Bible Jesus is no stranger to Jerusalem, having visited several times since his childhood. But on Jesus' final trip, the Bible tells us there's trouble. He arrives for the Passover holiday with an entourage and takes on the authorities in front of stunned onlookers. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Ultimately, he's betrayed by Judas, arrested, and brought before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. He's sentenced to death and begins his torturous walk to the site of his crucifixion. So wherever Jesus was imprisoned and put on trial would be the starting point for the Via Dolorosa. For 1,000 years, the trial was thought to have taken place at the Antonia Fortress, the Roman army barracks. But very recently, local archaeologists have dug up startling new evidence that might prove he was tried here instead. And that would change everything. Can we pinpoint the route Jesus walked to his crucifixion? I'm here on the western side of the old city, which is the opposite end of town from the Via Dolorosa. I've come to meet an archaeologist who's made a discovery that turns the traditional pilgrimage route upside down. Amit Reem gives me special access to his recent archaeological discovery at the Tower of David, the remains of King Herod's lost palace. So where are we? What is this building? Actually, we are standing in a part of a compound. Uh, his name is the Kishli. The Kishli was used as a Turkish prison in the 19th century and a British prison during World War I. But deep beneath those layers, Amit uncovered a treasure lost to history for 2,000 years. We started to excavate. We removed the floor of the, of the British prison and the Turkish building. Amit has uncovered the foundation stones of King Herod's lost palace. It was enormous palace. It's magnificent. A lot of gold, silver, lavishly decorated. Here's the connection. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate, the man who condemned Jesus to death, often stayed at Herod's palaces. Amit and other archaeologists believe that Pilate would have stayed and held court here. So some people have claimed that this would be where the trial of Jesus took place. What do you think about that? In that way, probably this was the place of the trial. 
So instead of receiving his death sentence at the Antonia Fortress, it seems much more likely it happened here at the Tower of David. And if so, we'd be standing very near the spot where Jesus was condemned to death. Jeff, I'm an archaeologist. I'm dealing only with the hard physical evidence. This is a place where you can feel those events. This is the story of Jerusalem. Living history. Yes, living history. This is magic. Now that I've seen new evidence of Herod's palace, I must be close to the exact spot where Jesus was sentenced to death. Cutting through the marketplace is the best way to get around the old city. I'm heading to a site one expert believes is the place of the trial. Here in the old city, they take their homeless very seriously. I'm gonna go duck into one of these shops now and check out some kafiyas, which are the famous Palestinian headscarves. Assalamu alaikum. It's impossible to resist all the local goods, and I can't go home empty-handed. Or Jeff in English. Jeff news. <laughs> Can I see some kafiyas? Yes, which color I can. So do these mean anything to the different colors? Yes. This is the black, Palestinian. Mm -hmm. This is the red one, Jordan. I would hope Jesus had one of these, braving the long, hot pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Here, this is the best one. I show you how can you wear this one. Yes, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. See? How do I look? It's gorgeous. How's that? <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> How much would you like for this? I love it. I make a good deal for you. Give me a good one. I, because you are not rich. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I say 100, maybe I make it for this one only 100. 100? Yes, this is for the board. Halas, 100, so you got good. it. <laughs> and I got myself a new kefir. Somewhere around Herod's palace, Jesus stood trial and began his grueling walk to his crucifixion. But I want to know exactly where this all happened. This is where all judgments were passed. You were standing on the spot where he stood the last morning of his life. I'm here just outside the walls of the Tower of David Museum in Jerusalem with archaeologist James Tabor to figure out what really happened on Jesus' last days. King Herod's palace would be just over these walls, adjacent to the Kishle prison site we visited. James says this is the very spot where Jesus stood when he was sentenced to death. This Herod's wall. palace is inside this wall. Okay. And this was the grand entrance into the Praetorium. Okay. So this is one of the gates of the Herodian city. The Praetorium mentioned in the Bible was the headquarters for the Roman military and the governor. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the Praetorium. And these stones here on each side, and also these stones. You know how people want to walk where Jesus walked? This, beyond any doubt, Jesus walked up these stones, up the stairs, but it was on the last morning of his life. And the steps themselves have a haunting name. The famous Steps to Nowhere. <laughs> now that's the foundation of a walkway going up. There was an entranceway there going into Herod's palace, into the Praetorium. And Jesus walked up these 2,000-year-old steps, as we're doing now, to where Pontius Pilate sat. And this is where he would have had his judgment seat. This is the official seat of Roman government in the province of Judea. This is where all judgments were passed. You, you hit the gavel, so to speak. You stamp your papers. So let me just read you the one verse. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And the crowds that see, look behind you, or down below. 
and they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And it says, and he delivered him over to be crucified. But it always got me, every time I've been here, look, these thorns growing. Mm -hmm. And it reminds you of a key part of the story. Jesus is kept all night inside the wall and uh, they make the crown of thorns. There's thorns all over this place still today, 2,000 years later. Just as the Bible says, they put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. So this is what the crown of thorns was made Something out of. Something like that. I think there's a sense in which this would be the holiest spot in uh, Jerusalem for Christians. You know, we can debate where was the crucifixion and where was Jesus buried and all of that, but as far as this judgment seat of Pilate, I think we've, we've got it. This is it. We're standing on the, the spot where he stood the last morning of his life. I'm following Jesus' life story from Nazareth to the Galilee and now walking the path of his final day. This brings me back to the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross. We're following the stations of the cross along this Via Dolorosa. So this is the third and the fourth stations here. The third station is where Jesus falls the first time, and the fourth is where he meets his mother, Mary. The seventh station, here Jesus falls the second time. And this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the final stop. So this is now the tradition says Jesus' clothes were ripped off of him and then he was brought up onto the cross to be crucified. Here Jesus dies and his body is laid in the tomb, the Holy Sepulchre itself. But where was he buried? That's the big question. James Tabor asked me to meet him in an area on the outskirts of Jerusalem called Bethphage, a place the Bible says Jesus visited during his final days. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. So. 2,000 years ago, this was uh, somebody's property, probably a farm, it's rural, by the village of Bethphage, mentioned in the Gospels. Here you've got three tombs lined up. You see how they're cut out of the solid bedrock? Yep. You can see this one particularly. Look what it has in the entrance. <laughs> a rolling, rolling stone. stone. Yeah. How common is that? It's rare. This is amazing, a hand-cut tomb with a rolling stone covering its opening, just like the New Testament describes. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. So to put you on the spot, do you think this could be the tomb? Bible scholar and archaeologist James Tabor is leading me through a pair of ancient tombs that shed light on Jesus' death and burial. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb. So, to put you on the spot, do you think this could be the tomb? Well, I mean, it could be, but... It depends on where the crucifixion was and lots of other questions. But there's something more about this tomb. Okay. You're going to get a real surprise. You Can have I to just... squeeze through. We'll need a flashlight. Can I just roll that stone back? Well, you could give it a try. It's not too hard. Just kind of sneak on down now. Jesus. You can squeeze through, I think. It's not too hard. It's kind of a tight squeeze. Okay. But the reason I brought you here 
is this this is a plastered wall look at this huh. i've never seen this in any tomb so this isn't a bedrock somebody's covered this with yeah, a, with a lime see. plaster and you got your eyes have to kind of adjust but look right here uh. look at this you've got greek letters you've got a oh god like a tree of life yeah symbol. yeah You've got like the infinity type sign. Can you see that? Look. Yeah. So what does this mean? Someone is coming here in a tomb, putting mystical symbols that I think probably have to do with Jesus, uh, praising God, maybe resurrection, uh, whatever all of these mean. Nobody's actually figured it out. The exact meaning of the graffiti in this tomb is still a mystery, but the symbols appear to have Judeo-Christian overtones, and many of the tomb's details, the hand cutting, the rolling stone, echo what's described in the Gospels. I want to walk around here and down because we've got this other tomb that we can really just walk in. So just squeeze on in. And this is the first chamber. Wow, you can see the chisel marks. Yeah, it's just cut out of solid rock. You got the shafts, you got the benches where they would put the body. It's huge. Look, there's another chamber. Let's go in here. Hundreds of tombs like this one have been found around Jerusalem, but fewer in this pristine shape. Here we can see how Jews in the time of Jesus buried their dead. And it, the style is just a dead giveaway. This, so it's only in the first century that they're cutting that these tombs this, into the rock. This style of, of uh, with the shafts, you see the shafts behind you and behind me, and that's where you would uh, put the uh, body. And when the body sort of desiccated and so forth, they would gather the bones and actually put them into these boxes. What's compelling here is these bone boxes or ossuaries are mostly found around Jerusalem during a short period surrounding the decades when Jesus lived. The most famous ossuaries were discovered at the Talpio tomb. The location Tabor believes is the tomb of Jesus. So tell me about the discovery of the Talpio tombs. Well, Imagine a tomb like this. It was found in 1980 by a construction blast. So the whole front part of it was blown off. But the inner chamber, like the one we're sitting in, is still intact. Inside the Talpio tomb, in shafts like these, archaeologists found 10 ossuaries, six of which, James says, are inscribed with some very familiar biblical names. Of course, the main one everybody knows is Jesus, son of Joseph, but it's the other names besides that that r really give it a context that might refer to Jesus of Nazareth. Those names also include a Maria or Mary and one more that's astonishing. Very explosive. There's a Jude, son of Jesus. So whoever Son they, of? Yeah. So whoever this Jesus is, he had a kid named Jude. Of course, I have to remember the Bible never mentions Jesus being married or having a child. I don't think you could find anything more controversial. You know, but if you go back to the first century, it's not controversy at all. A Jewish man being married and having a child, it would be not only expected, it would be almost obligated. It's a shocking idea. But James has some evidence to back up his provocative theory at the world-famous Israel Museum. This is a treasure trove of the most significant archaeological discoveries in the history of the Holy Land. So now look, look, here we are. What we're looking at are the actual ossuaries discovered in the Talpio tomb. But these are some very special ones. So this is the actual ossuary from Talpio. It's not a reproduction, it's the real thing. And who's this? Read it. Yehuda 
Bar Yeshua, son of Jesus. Yeah. It's an explosive idea, and I'm not yet convinced. I need a bit more of a debate with James to hash it out. A great excuse to grab some Turkish coffee. For you? James, you've made some extraordinary claims here about the Talpia tomb, but I can think of a lot of problems with this theory. So first of all, these names seem to be pretty common in the first century, right? It's absolutely the most common objection. <laughs> so common names is a common objection. Jesus was a fairly common name back then, and Joseph was even more common. But the nickname used on one of the ossuaries, Yose, is rare. And yet, Jesus' brother had the nickname Yose. And so you've got to put the whole cluster together. If you think of uh, the Arbeatles, the famous music group, and George and Paul and John are really common British names, but Ringo's not. Yose's our Ringo in the tomb. James's theory raises one more major controversy. If Jesus' remains were found in the Talpia tomb, as he claims, what about the resurrection? According to the Bible, when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. There are two possibilities. Jesus was crucified. He's dead. He's buried. If the tomb is empty, either is taken bodily into heaven, and you'll never find a body, or he was reburied somewhere else. Tabor is not giving up on his theory that the Talpio tomb was Jesus's final resting place. As an archaeologist, I need to see the Talpio tomb for myself. So I've just been dropped off in this neighborhood called Talpio in Jerusalem. Supposedly, the tomb is here. I have no idea where, though, and there doesn't seem to be any signs. Tourists don't come here. It's not really a, a destination, so... I'm just going to have to work my way around and figure it out. I'm not really sure where I'm going, so... <laughs> and I don't want to ask for directions. Jeff? Fortunately, my crew's on the case as well. This way? I have no idea what I'm looking at. <laughs> Is this it? I mean, it was described to me as a, as a sealed concrete chunk uh, with this number 005 on it, so that must be from the Antiquities Authority. But this is it. This is the Talpia tomb. And, you know, I'm just here in the middle of a, a nondescript residential neighborhood. No plaques, no signs, no markings. What James calls the family tomb of Jesus, probably the most contentious archeological find in the Holy Land, now hides under a plain concrete slab. It is surreal looking at this because if I hadn't been told about this specifically, I'd have no idea what this was. It's just, you know, I'd think it was, a, it was a utility chamber, you know, phone lines coming through here, water lines coming through here, so it, uh, it's surreal. And permanently sealed. One of the reasons for that is in Israeli law, all bones have to be collected and reburied elsewhere because they can't be desecrated. So regardless of who was buried in here, we will never know more than the ossuaries tell us. I've talked to all these experts, nobody agrees. So it's kind of like the gospels themselves. It comes down to a question of faith. I followed in the footsteps of Jesus' life. I see how a boy's upbringing during times of turmoil may have influenced his beliefs. I've been to Nazareth, his hometown. I've seen where Jesus worked in Sepphoris. I've seen where he preached in the Galilee and here in Jerusalem where he was crucified and laid to rest. There is enough evidence to suggest that there was a radical rabbi, a teacher, a, a, a wise man from the Galilee who came down to Jerusalem with this movement and was crucified for it. 2,000 years later, he's still 
one of the most important historical figures that ever lived.